Hello everyone, I'm pretty excited. I just found this mainboard from a 486 computer from 1994 and these were 32-bit computers. You can tell that because it has a 32-bit slot here called a Visa Local Bus Slot. And basically you just plug in something like this. This is a Visa Local Bus graphics card and it would just plug in there. Now it also has some 16-bit slots for one of these. This is just a 16-bit graphics card, and this is what you'd expect to find on a 486, or at least an earlier one. But then I saw this slot here, and I thought, that's really puzzling. What's that for? Obviously, you have 8-bit slots in the first half of the 16-bit slot, so why do you need a special 8-bit slot at the end here? And then it occurred to me, you see, way back in 1981, 13 years before this 486 mainboard, IBM introduced their CGA graphics card, Color Graphics Adapter. This is an original one here from IBM. And you can see it's 8 bits because of the 8-bit card edge here that's supposed to plug into an 8-bit slot on the mainboard. But we're going to have a problem plugging it into the 8-bit part of one of these 16-bit slots. And the reason is that we just have a little notch cut out here the rest of the card just continues along in line with the 8-bit card edge. So if we tried to plug that in, it would just jam on the second part of the slot. But what about this one here? And if we take a look, voila, it just slots in. So now I have a question. Is this original IBM CGA card going to work in a mainboard from 13 years later? Also in today's video, we're going to be troubleshooting my IBM PC, which has been having all sorts of issues lately, everything from crashing and hanging in games and on boot up to divider errors and parity errors. But let's get back to putting a CGA card in a 486 computer. We have to get this going. Can you imagine running a graphics card from an original IBM PC that ran at 4.77 megahertz in a 486 machine with an Intel DX4 chip that ran at 100 megahertz, more than 20 times the clock speed. So let's see, we have to line the angle at the corner of the chip up with the point in the top of the socket. So that just slots in like that. And then we're gonna to have to put some memory in. Now, I really only need about one megabyte of memory today, but I'm gonna use these topless turbo chips. They're four megabytes each, so that'll give us eight, which is way more than we're gonna need. Now, I'll plug in a power supply, and we always put the black leads uh, in the center of the socket. So it'll plug in like that, and like that. And then, of course, we're going to need a keyboard. Uh, so that just plugs into the keyboard connector like that. And the only thing that remains now is to plug an original IBM CJ monitor into this graphics card. Well, I've set everything up on my bench and I put a fan on the CPU just to keep it a bit cooler. So let's turn it on and see what happens. Hopefully no smoke. So here goes. And look at that, it came straight up. It looks like it's gonna work. So I haven't put a hard drive on this yet, so I'm gonna do that next and we'll see if we can boot all the way up. Well, good news, it all seems to be working. So let's just run a standard test here. This is Fractint, which draws all sorts of kinds of fractals. And uh, let's just run it in IBM 4 color CGA mode, which amazingly it supports. And yeah, really quickly drawn because it's a 486. So now I wanna try this with my favorite CGA game, Zaxxon. Well, it seems to be working, but <laughs> yeah, it's way too fast. I can't control it at that speed. And how do I make it go down? It's not going down. Yeah, this is not working at all. There's something wrong with it. Yeah, it's just too quick. You, the game is over before you've even started. And this is only to be expected. I mean, it is 20 times faster, well, more than 20 times faster than the IBM PC. But not all games run way too fast. This is Grand Prix Circuit CGA version, and this is actually really playable. In fact, it's way more maneuverable than if you were playing it on, say, a 286. But it's obviously not 20 times faster. And in fact, the 486 is a much faster chip clock for clock than what was in the IBM PC. So it should be way more than 20 times faster. So what's actually going on here? Well, of course, it's the bus to that CGA card. That's only eight bits, and it's only running at about the same speed as a Turbo XT, a little bit faster than the IBM PC. 
And so what this means is that we're not sending data to the graphics card any faster than we would be on that machine. The only thing that's faster is all the computation that's being done by the CPU itself. And so that's why the game is smoother and more playable. Oh, I just had a cunning idea. Why don't we go into the chipset features of this BIOS and disable the auto configuration and then we can fiddle with the speed of the bus. At the moment it is set to a quarter of clock in and clock in is the front side bus speed, 33 megahertz. So let's take it from a quarter of 33 megahertz up to a third of 33 megahertz. And let's see if that makes any difference to this game. Well, I can't tell whether this is faster or not. You tell me. So it's dead smooth and there's no appreciable jerkiness or anything in the frame rate, except at the beginning there where it's just accelerating. And so the frame rate must be really high, but was it this high before already? Um, I just can't tell. Maybe if you slow the video down and count the frames, you'll be able to see. But what I think we need to do is to write some code so that we can actually push data as fast as possible into the CJ memory and just see how much difference it actually makes. Actually, while I was cooking my dinner, I realized that I don't need to write code to test the video RAM speed. I can use Jim Len, the CGA compatibility tester. And this has an option for testing the memory write speed and comparing it with an IBM CGA card in an IBM PC. And as you can see, it's getting 583 kilobytes per second instead of 340, so almost twice as fast. And I'm running it here just at a quarter of front side bus speed. So let's try it at a third of the front side bus speed. And here it is, and this is a little bit bizarre. It's actually the same speed. Uh, I would have thought it would have sped it up for sure. So I'm a little bit suspicious about this. I'm gonna try it at half the speed of the front side bus and see if that makes any difference. Well, yeah, at half the speed, it's 808 kilobytes per second. So yeah, it does speed up, but uh, not for every increment in the BIOS. That's really bizarre. I don't know how to explain that. At any rate, uh, well, let's try the game now with this at the half front side bus speed. Well, I guess if I couldn't tell before, I'm probably not gonna be able to tell now, but uh, let me know what you think. Does this look faster or not? And I don't really know what's going on with the timings at all. Uh, maybe that's a question for Jim Leonard. If he happens to see this video, he might comment below. But uh, one possibility is that the timer itself is actually being sped up and only on the highest setting is there a different ratio between it and the CGA card. So I think what we need to do is go back to my original strategy of writing some code so we can time it with an external timer like a stopwatch to see if this is really faster or not. This is what I came up with overnight. It fills the CGA memory as fast as possible 60 times then changes the color. And the colors change 16 times in total. So if this whole thing took 16 seconds, that would mean we had 60 frames per second. And from that, we could compute the actual data rate. What we just saw is with the bus speed set at the maximum value of half clock in, and at the moment it's at one third clock in, and it is actually slow, so that settles that. But if you look on the screen, I've listed all the timings that I got for the different BIOS options, and two of them are actually the same, which is what Jim Lennon's program said. And this is a bit of a mystery. If you have any idea what's going on here, let me know in the comments below. There's actually one more thing that I can run, this rotating icosahedron effect that I wrote recently for the channel. And this will probably run way too fast, but uh, it should be pretty smooth, I think. Let's give it a try. And it obviously does the pre-computation very fast. And actually that's not too bad. It just looks really smooth. And it's not going too fast at all. I thought it would just be over in a blink of an eye, but... Unfortunately, the version that I wrote for the higher resolution in proper mode doesn't actually work properly. You can see the first part was over in the blink of an eye and the rest has some kind of weird pattern effect on the actual shapes themselves. Uh, so obviously the CGA cards is not able to keep up with that one at this frequency. Well, we've seen today that if you run the bus speed fast enough, the CGA card gets about twice the performance it would on an IBM PC. And it seems to run pretty stably as well, which is nice. But it doesn't seem like very much, given that the 486 CPU is running more than 20 times faster than the CPU in the IBM PC. So is it all worth it after all? 
Well, I believe it is because in a lot of games and demos, uh, the time is actually spent doing computation rather than just displaying the pixels on the screen. And so if you have a much faster CPU as you do in a 486, then you can expect to get some really cool demo effects. You could even use a text mode of the CGA card, uh, perhaps one that doesn't suffer from snow like the IBM CGA card, and uh, use the 16 color mode uh, so you have graphics in 160 by 100 resolution. And I think you could do some really cool stuff. So this is something that we have to come back to, I think, in a later video on the channel. Well, I think it's time to take a look at my IBM PC, which, as I said, has been having all sorts of problems lately. Even on boot up, it just crashes randomly. As MS-DOS is booting here, you can see what I'm talking about with the screen wobbling every time the floppy drive makes noise. Uh, this is nothing more than an annoyance, but it is indicative that there's something not quite right there. Well, that's pretty cool. While I was looking for a copy of Check It to run on this machine, I noticed something interesting. Take a look at what happens when I just bump the PC. I get the same distortion on the screen. And I was getting the same thing when I was pressing the keyboard before, but now I get nothing. The machine is actually hung. Uh, it's still flashing the cursor, so I guess the video card is working, but uh, the machine itself is not. So this is definitely a big hint, and I suspect we're going to find some kind of electrical issue inside. Well, I'm getting all of the problems tonight. Uh, so this is just booting the machine, and as you can see, it's given me a divider overflow before it finished booting DOS. First up, let's run Check It, and I'll run a memory check just to see whether there's any issues there. And then, of course, I can also tap the machine while it's running and see whether anything goes wrong. Uh, so I'll just do a simple memory test at the moment, and uh, this will take a long time to run uh, anyway, and we'll see whether it comes up with anything. And there you have the result. No memory issues found by Check It at all, but I was able to get the machine to hang by tapping on the case. And so I think there's an electrical issue, dry solder joint or something like that. But there's something else I want to check first. Deep inside the machine is this adjustment here and it's used to uh, adjust the composite output. But if I just tap it with a pen, you can see that it's completely broken. And I'm wondering whether that's moving about when the machine's being tapped, and that's actually what's causing all of the problem. So uh, given that we know that this is a, an issue, let's try that first. I'll try poking at it while the machine's running, and we'll see what the result is. Well, I won't touch anything else. I'll just tap that potentiometer and uh, yeah, look at that. There's all sorts of things going on here. So uh, let's replace that first and see whether that's actually our issue. Fortunately, I have a salvage board here. This came out of a machine that was in really bad way and one of the capacitors was blown up on it. I've also plundered a few capacitors from here and I know that some of the RAM is faulty. But this pot is uh, in really good condition, so I'm going to take that off and put that in mine and see if that solves our problem. Well, this is the old pot here, and as you can see, it's in pieces. Uh, I've pulled the other one out and put it through the board. Uh, so it should just be a matter of soldering this in now. Of course, one always has to turn everything on on camera to prevent anything interesting happening. Let's hope we don't get any sparks here. And no sparks, no smoke. That's a good start. Uh, but do we get a flashing cursor? Yes, we do. So let's let it boot up and we'll see whether or not we get any noise when we move the machine. Well, it's booting up right now and I'm not seeing any vibration on the screen. So if I tap the machine now, you can tap it really quite hard and nothing's happening, so I think we got it actually. So maybe that was the issue that was causing all of those faults. The other thing I want to look at is this parallel port card, which I believe is an original IBM one. It should be a giveaway with the numbering here. And uh, so I really want to use this one if I can, but one day I was using my parallel port for my zip drive and it just died uh, when I reset the machine. And I tried everything. Uh, resetting the card, reset the machine, uh, you know, unplug and plug in the zip drive and so on. The drive was fine and it wasn't until I replaced the card with another one uh, that I was able to get it working again.
So I don't really want to use this card. I'll put this one back in and we'll try and figure out what the problem is and maybe diagnose this board and see if we can fix it. Now there's no hard drive in this machine so I'm just going to go to the C drive and this will be my zip drive. So let's take a look and see whether it's working now. And it is. Well that's a mysterious thing. I really didn't expect that that problem which just seemed to be permanent, it wasn't something that was happening every now and again, uh, would be to do with the potentiometer. So, well, there's another problem dealt with. Well, I've restarted the machine about 10 times now and there haven't been any problems at all. So I've switched the harness around on the two floppy drives to see if I can boot from the B drive. And uh, it does actually seem to be working. So I'm a little bit puzzled by that as well because I have no idea how issues with the floppy drive could be fixed by that potentiometer. Uh, that's uh, a little bit bizarre to be honest. Uh, so anyway, uh, this is going to be a, a short video because, well, it's just not causing any issues anymore. Another test I can run is to copy all the files from the floppy onto my zip drive and see whether or not there's an issue uh, with the floppy perhaps on the second side or something like that. Uh, it's just got me a little bit puzzled at the moment why it seems to be working when uh, in the past I've had issues uh, you know copying files off it or accessing certain files and that seems to have gone through just fine so uh, yeah I'm mystified at this point that B drive seems absolutely fine. And now I have a little bit of a puzzle for my viewers. Leave a comment below if you know the answer. So on this drive here, you can see that there appears to be a chip missing. Now it's not actually missing. I've got a new old stock drive, which I purchased a few years ago. Unfortunately, it doesn't work, but it also doesn't have this chip. But this drive here does have one and it says T-Res on the top of the chip. So what is that chip? Uh, leave a comment below if you know the answer. Well, there is one other thing wrong with this machine and that is that there's no sound. The speaker is fine and I've tried another one and I still get no sound. Uh, so it's not a connection issue and it's probably something wrong with one of the chips. So that is something that we'll have to look into in a future episode. Well, that's going to be it for this week, guys. Uh, troubleshooting videos tend to have a habit of either being way too short or way too long. And in this case, I guess we got lucky and so many of the problems seem to be related to that one issue. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed looking at putting a CGA card in a 486 and uh, repairing my IBM PC. So we'll see you in a later video. Bye.